ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد قائد الغر المحجلين وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه إلى يوم الدين اللهم فقهنا في الدين وعلمنا التأويل وألهمنا بفيض فضلك رشدنا يا رب العالمين الحمد لله In our lessons on looking at understanding the most beautiful names of Allah on divine beauty we are beginning today by an opening introduction to understand why we study the names of Allah Most High and to appreciate how learning about the names of Allah Most High is how you come to know and understand and appreciate who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And by knowing who Allah is and understanding who Allah is and appreciating who Allah is, would, would you incline towards Allah? And by inclining towards Allah, the names give you insights of how you seek Allah most high in your life how you draw closer to Allah in your life, but also how you characterize yourself with those qualities of perfection, of virtue, of excellence that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because every single one of these names is a meaning that Allah Most High possesses. These are all meanings of beauty and these are all names of beauty and perfection. And one of the insights that the great scholars who wrote about the divine names explained also is how do you characterize yourself with the qualities of slavehood, of being a servant of Allah, appropriate to those names. Some are very obvious, that if Allah Most High is the All-Merciful, Ar-Rahman, how do you, as a servant of Allah, exemplify this quality? It's very obvious. If Allah is All-Merciful, we strive to be merciful to all. However, the benefit of study, as opposed to mere reading, is that it gives insight. Because sometimes, you know, we are limited in our understanding, right? So, for example, if we take the, the divine name, the, the all-merciful, we say, okay, I'll be merciful to those around me. But no, our mercy is not only to those around us. It's not only to fellow believers. Our mercy is supposed to be to all that exists. And that's far wider than those around you or fellow believers or fellow human beings or even living things. And there you appreciate prophetic teachings. Why? Because we are not supposed to ill-treat even inanimate objects. That for example, if, the, if you, in the old days they used to use Pens made out of reed, wood. Once it's done, what do you do with it? They say, no, you have respect for it because this is a creation of Allah. So you don't just throw it. You put it away. You put it away. because This is something worthy of respect. You don't waste. The Prophet ﷺ told us, you have mercy even with water. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't waste water even if you make wudu in front of you know, at a mighty river. Now, if you make wudu in front of a big river, from a big river, will it affect the river in any way? No. But you don't waste, you don't, you don't waste water. Why? Because this is creation. This is creation. So you have respect for it. And there's many other examples. There's a stone. It's not from the prophetic manners that if you're walking down the street, you see a stone, you don't kick it. Why? هذا خلق الله. This is the creation of Allah. 
we have mercy, right? concern for good, even for inanimate objects. Okay, there's a stone on the way. The Prophet ﷺ told us, what do you do with the stone that's on the street, on the road? You pick it up. But even the word the Prophet ﷺ used, you remove it from the way. Right? The ob most obvious thing, there's a stone on the road, what do you do? Just kick it away. No, but you pick it up. Why? So you gain insight that if that these are the names and qualities of the divine. Who are you? Each of these names, you are the servant of the one who has these names. Now some names are appear obvious in meaning, but they are deep meanings related to them. Other names have unexpected meanings. And I'll just give one example. One of Allah's names is Al-Jabbar. And this is a danger of superficial Islam. That okay, you know the one word translation, Islam. Al-Jabbar, one of the meanings of Al-Jabbar is, anyone know what Al-Jabbar is? Hmm? Yeah, sometimes trying to say is the compelling or the overwhelming. The overwhelming. But then the ulama ask, is this a name of majesty or a name of mercy? And Al-Jabbar right, is not just the overwhelming, right, the overwhelming, the compelling. Al-Jabbar is also the, the healing. Why? In Arabic, a kas is called a jabira. Because jabr is to encompass something and to have control over it. Jabr from which you have Al-Jabbar, the all-encompassing in power, that has majesty, بِيَدِهِ مَلَكُوتُ السَّمَاوَاتِ الْأَرْضِ In his grasp is the dominion of the heavens and the earth. It's also mercy. It's also mercy. Why? That the one who, in whose, ha in whose complete control is the heavens and the earth, he is the one who is taking care of every little thing, every delicate little thing. And he's the healer of hearts. He's the healer of hearts. He's the giver of solace. So it's a name of both majesty and mercy. And so learning about these is not an intellectual exercise. Is that so when we read in the Quran about the names of Allah, we have the tools of reflection. We have the tools of reflection. That what do these mean? So we can reflect on them. It also helps us in many other ways that we will explore, as we will see today, bi'idhnihi subhanahu wa ta'ala. So today we'll look at a couple of investigations to open the text. The first is that we need to step back a little. Right? And always a believer begins with purpose. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always calls us to have purpose in anything that we do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his mercy has respect for us. Because he has honored us. So he never ever tells us to do something without telling us why. He doesn't just tell us, follow the Prophet ﷺ. He tells us, for example, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ Truly have in the Messenger of Allah the most beautiful of examples. So he's telling us that follow him because he's the best example you could follow. From that, actually, if you reflect, you'd understand that everyone follows someone. So he's the best of example. That's actually an argument in itself, if you think about it. Why would you follow him? You have in the Messenger of Allah the most beautiful examples for whoever seeks Allah in the last life. And if you pause and reflect on it, that you have a purpose in life, which is that you should be seeking Allah and your, and your next life, your eternal advantage. If you do so, then take him as an example. And even the way Allah puts things in the Quran for us is to make us think and reflect. And that's mercy. 
that's mercy. He could just say, okay, I'm your Lord. You know, like some companies, okay, you've joined. These are 25 things you have to do. Here's a task list that's ready. Go through them. And you check it off. Don't ask, why are you doing these 25 things? You say, don't ask me, I just work here. Now, you're a servant of the Lord of the world. He says, do these 25 things, just do it. it you know, in life, you have, you have a life job, which is to serve God. Just do it. But that's not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses us. And that's mercy too. But he tells us about himself as well. And part of the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about himself is that he is giving us the opportunity to express our love and our care. Reflection, one of the scholars put it, is an act of courtship with the divine. It's an act of courtship with the divine. If anyone knows love, love entails courtship in all its expression. Right? It's a relationship. Right? Now, but part of that is to value the one you love. Even with, you know, if, if, you, if you work in business, there's, there's, a, there's a customer, they say, okay, I like this job, so I'll do it. No, there's a negotiation, and a negotiation is a courtship. It's a courtship. Okay. And if it wasn't, people wouldn't take clients to the golf and all kinds of weird things. Not a fan of golf. Um, you can read um, Malcolm Gladwell for the case against golf. So we have a need in life, right? And what is the nature of our need? The nature of our need is very simple. That if you think about it, you know what our need is expressed the way you're born. You're born, you're born naked, unable to feed yourself, unable, unable even to clean yourself, and you're needy. But we, from childhood, we understand our need in an accidental way. What's the accidental way? I'm hungry, I need food. I use the toilet, I need to get cleaned when you're small. I'm thirsty, I need a drink. But if you were to reflect, your need is more fundamental than that. Your need is firstly for existence itself. Were they created from nothing? Or did they create themselves? No. The very fact that you exist expresses the neediness that you need someone to create you. But then, how do you remain in existence? How do you remain in existence? Even at a practical level, are you making your heart beat? You know, like you have a drum, you know, you have to keep hitting your heart, like, you know, with a good tune. No, your heart is beating. Do you know what, you know, some, something's going on in your liver. You know what your liver does? I don't either. <laughs> right? <laughs> something's going on there. I don't really know what it does, but it's there. And presumably it's kind of important. There, kidneys do some pretty important things too. You know what your, the kidney does? Good. <laughs> Science is overrated. Uh, <laughs> right? Kidneys are pretty important. I don't really know what it does, but it does something. I know it's important. You know, I have immediate family that had kidney transplant. I still didn't find out what they do. Just something in your body that you need as, as part of your living package. But you're not making any of it work. All of it. And not just particulars. All of it, you're in need to remain in existence. So consciously or unconsciously, we realize that there is a fundamental need. There's a contingent need, which is where most people turn to God, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. That when people are drowning, they call upon Allah. Some people came to Sayyidina Ja'far. Oh, sorry. Um... um Sayyidina Ja'far al-Sadiq, right? the, the, you know, the fifth grandson of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. 
And they said, we don't believe in God. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. People, oh my God, people are leaving Islam. People left Islam in the time of the Prophet People left Islam in droves during the time of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. This is the nature of the human struggle. All the prophets, there's people who believed in them, there's people who didn't, and there's people who wavered. That's life. Nothing is new under the sun. It's just different packaging. So this man came to Sayyidina Jafar, a Sadiq, and said, I don't believe in God. He asked him, what are you? Like, what's your profession? He said, I'm, 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 a, I'm a sailor. I travel the oceans. He said, you know, when, you're, when the waves are, are tall and your ship is being tossed around, the one you turn to, that's God. The man thought about it. And he said, yes. That there are these desperate moments when there's something that you turn to, that something, that's God. Right? Because the human being, by the very reality, is needy. You don't exist by yourself. Now, our consciousness deludes us from this. So we have a, a need, an innate need to turn to God. But we call to upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As believers, we recognize some basic truths. So we choose to call upon the one who has created us and the one who's sustaining us. And the act of the acts of devotion, the acts of making dua of dhikr, these remind us of our basic need. These remind us of our basic need. And these names of Allah tell us about whom we turn to in need. Of whom we turn to in need. Because who is God? Right? God is the one worthy of worship. But what is worship? Worship is absolute expression of need. Worship is not a transactional act. Okay, I'll put my forehead on the ground. And you'll give me paradise. Right? When we were in university, a friend of mine, he won all these contests because they did a contest that, okay, how many people can you convince to grow a beard? And that, those days, having a beard wasn't, um, um, you know, wasn't fashionable like it, it is now. So one of my friends in medical school convinced half his non-Muslim friends to grow beards too. He said, I'll take you out for dinner. He's a wealthy guy. But then he can, then says, okay, how many people can we bring out to Fajr? And he got some of his non-Muslim friends to come. So look, just come join in. We'll, we'll go for breakfast after. And when you're at university, people do all kinds of stuff for, you know, for, for a free meal. So they, they prayed too. It's not the act of putting your forehead on the ground that is the worship. It is that meaning within that is expressed. And that meaning within that is expressed. We do that and we go through the motions, but the names tell us about the one who has these meanings. Whom are we turning to? And we understand from the divine names, why are we turning to him? We appreciate God. Right? And how do we become realized in who God is? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about himself in the Quran. Right? Very often we think, about Qur'an as a book of guidance. But what is guidance? What is guidance? What's guidance? How to do something, right? Could I pick on you? Okay, okay, Shamim, get up. Could you? Please. Okay, we'll now you don't have to come on the camera. We'll run an example. If I just come over here. There there's a there's a brother. If I t tell you, Shamim, walk. Thank you. I, did I tell him stop? No, but he did stop. Why? You can sit down. 
Why did he stop? Because I told him what to do. But I didn't tell him why to do it. So that actually, it actually doesn't make sense. He just goes through the motions. You just do it. But then you'll stop. But if you understand why you're doing something, then you'll have purpose. If I told Shamin, please go to the front door because there is um, there's delivery of lunch. Sorry, there's no lunch today. <laughs> I'm invited to lunch at my, with my parents. But, you know, and the guy's going to leave. So the more you know of why you need to go to the door, the faster you're going to walk. Right? And you're going to fulfill some purpose. That's why we want to know as believers. We want to understand. And this is very, very important. It's important for us and important for our children too. The most important thing, right, the Prophet ﷺ tells us, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينَ Whomever Allah wishes well for, He grants deep understanding of religion. Because right? superficial understanding of religion actually makes no sense whatsoever. Once I was I had a terrible, terrible trip to the States. At least the beginning was terrible. I was invited to a community and there's a sister who invited, said, we, we've, I've opened an Islamic center that's meant to be a center for education, catering to converts and this and this and this. All these amazing things. With, at the encouragement of Imam Zaid Shakir. Oh. And all these things. I went, turns out it was her house. <laughs> and, and we have housing for visiting scholars. It was actually the attic. But there's no heating in the attic. And it was... You know, it was the northeast of the U.S. And in November, it gets cold. Especially on the attic. And there's no, forget a, a bed or a mattress. There's not even like sheets or a blanket. It was fascinating three days. Then I got on a train to go to New York City. And this large Irish-American lady said, Can I sit next to you? So I sat such that she was on the other side of the aisle. I have lots of questions. You're Muslim, right? I said, yes. I was like, oh my God. I said, I have lots of questions. And she sounded a bit aggressive. Turns out she was a nurse. And you know, sometimes nurses can be quite bossy. And one of the things she said, you guys really get up every single day at dawn? I said, yes. And then you stop during your work day and you pray? I said, yes. And then she, she read about the five prayers. And then at the end of the day, when it's dark, you pray again? Even though you're going to pray at dawn. I said, yes. I said, man. We're, we don't even do that at the... Yeah, she, she'd been to a Catholic convent. We don't even do that there. She just gave a... So... But then the obvious question, why do you do that? And the reason most people turn away from the deen, one of the reasons is, they don't know why they're doing it. And it's like our friends walk. If you don't know why you're doing something, why should you do it? It's actually irrational to do something without having a reason. Imagine if you called your friend and said, where are you? She said, um, I'm on the 401. What would you ask her? What would you ask her? Where are you going? Say, I don't know. I'm just on the 401. Right? Right? And then you, next day you call her, say, where are you? Said, I'm in the mall. Why are you there? I don't know, just thought I'd go to the mall. And then, you know, her uncle calls her and says, uh, Betty, uh, could you come over? Say, no, I, I'm at the butcher. Say, why are you at the butcher? I'm not sure. I just, I, I was told to go to the butcher. Right? But if you think about it, much of our connection to our deen is, you know, we live in Absurdistan. I don't know if you know about Absurdistan. Um, there's articles about Absurdistan. You can read them. Because it makes no sense. It, it makes no sense. And at some time, when you actually pause and think for a moment, if it doesn't make sense, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it. It's not just why you're doing it, but to appreciate why you're doing it. Because right? uncle says, Betty, uh, get 50 kilos of meat. kilos of meat but turns out uncle is inviting the whole family for an amazing feast and he's cook and he's arranging to cook her favorite meal and he's going to pay her for 
for the transportation costs and this and this and this. She said, I'll, I'll, I'll get you 50 kilos every week. I said, no, no, this, once a year I do this festival for the family. And that's how we drag our heels through our, through our religious practice. So we cultivate our faith by not just reciting the Qur'an, but by understanding the meanings of the Qur'an. And one of the things the Qur'an tells us about, that's the central theme of the Qur'an, is Allah. The central theme of the Qur'an is Allah. Because guidance is not what you do. Guidance is the way to get to a destination. Guidance is the way to get to your destination. You live reliant on your cell phone. You're looking at the directions and you slipped and it fell into the gutter. But now you have to, you know, but Jack needs to get to Uncle Bill's house because he's about to propose to Jill. But he lost his phone. But he still remembers the address. So he runs into Brother Shamim, said, um, could he guide me to 211 Ridgeway Road? So guidance is either the way, the things you do, but it's not the things you do. Imagine someone says, okay, I, I went straight, took right, went left, and then I stopped. No, guidance is you're, you're going somewhere. Okay? Imagine if you got there, say, khalas, I'm done. No, the point wasn't to just to follow the directions. The point was you, you're going somewhere. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, if you consider any page of the Quran, Allah is telling us about himself. But how does Allah tell us about himself? Through his names. Through his names. Throughout. And he connects the guidance, the teachings, to himself by the names. By the names. And those are or the key ways we reflect on the Qur'an. Is to reflect on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to connect, why is Allah using these names here? Why is Allah using these names here? But you can't reflect on those names unless you have some appreciation of what those names mean. At a basic level, you know what the general meaning of the name is. But the deeper the appreciation you have for what the name is, the more you can reflect on it. So this is one of the ways we cultivate our faith as we recite the Qur'an. That we should know about the names. Now practically, one of the things we should do with respect to this is the ulama used to recommend this of old. That when you recite the Qur'an, keep a pen and paper with you. Why? Because even when you have a devotional portion that you recite daily of the Qur'an, you should also have reflection. And they say the best thing is that when you're reciting the Qur'an, you only reflect briefly. That's one of the tricks of the shaitan. You say, okay, I have my routine of Qur'an. So then you decide to reflect. Then you say, oh, let me go to the window and reflect. Then what happens? Then you say, oh, let me grab a coffee. Right? And you didn't finish your routine. So they say, while you're when you're doing a routine of Qur'an, you reflect briefly. But sometimes something touches you. Or there's a name. It says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to himself as Raqib. What does Raqib mean again? So you just make a note. Okay, make a note. And then go back and that's... And... Find out more about this, about that name. That's one of the ways of seeking knowledge without seeking knowledge. That as you recite the Qur'an, something that you didn't understand or you didn't know or you wanted to know more about, just make a note about it. And that's why you have some books of tafsir, etc. Or this is something you go, you, you go to the masjid. Right? It's amazing. What's the point of people of knowledge? Say, Asalaamu Alaikum Mawlana. Make dua for you. You can make dua for yourself too. It's kind of nice. You get somebody else to make dua. But sometimes I stand at, at a masjid and see what do people ask? Learned scholars. It's rare that anyone asks them a question of religion. Unless there's some accident that happens, right? My mother, you know, can we pull the plug on my grandmother? Can we do this? These accidental things. 
But the real questions we should ask are the living faith questions. And one of the ways is, you, don't you read the Quran? When you do, do this practice. And one of the things you ask about is the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there's no single commentary on the names of Allah that comes anywhere close to encompassing the meanings of the, the names. I've gathered at least 25 books on the name, and there's many, many more. I probably have more than that, but just, and we're all resisting the urge to refer to too many in preparing for this class, but even the seven, eight, none of them are just duplicates of the other, because that's, these are, these are the names tell us about meanings that Allah has, and Allah is eternal, absolute, and without limits. So, so we become realized by cultivating our understanding through the Qur'an, but also through dua. Dua. When we turn to Allah in dua, we should turn to Allah with mention of His names. With mention of His names. And even just two names, Allah and Rabb, they're very different. What's they're very different. The du'as, right? And have you ever wondered why sometimes we say, Allahumma, ni, Allahumma inni as'aluka. You know, for example, Allahumma inni as'aluka khayra hadha al-yawm wa fathahu wa nasrahu wa nurahu wa barakatahu. For example, we say Allahumma. Other times we say Rabbi. Because they're very different in meaning. Because Allahumma, Allah is the name of majesty. It's called in Arabic, lafzul jalala. So we present ourselves before, when we say Allah, and then we'll see when we look at the name Allah, with complete humility, in utter need. But Rabb is a name of mercy, because Rabb is your caring, nurturing, sustaining, protecting Lord. It's of the names of mercy. So there, it's a different way of turning. But then we also, so many of the du'as of the Qur'an Sunnah mention other names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya hayyu ya qayyum, bi rahmatika astaghith. Oh, all living, all sustaining, it is in your mercy that I seek urgent aid. Why does it say ya hayy and ya qayyum? Right? Dua is not words that you say. It's need that you express. But what are you saying? Okay. There's a superficial practice of religion that in some contexts could survive. Everyone around you is religious and you just go with the flow. But it's from the mercy of Allah that he's shaken things up. That kind of attachment to religion is not sustainable pretty much anywhere. Even in rural areas and so on, people start having questions about belief in Allah. I went to one country and they're saying, you know, before we could just teach people, do this and they'll do it. Now they want to know about everything. What's wrong with people? I had to be very polite and no, Molana, we're supposed to, have you not considered the Quran? So I sort of coached them to the answer. It's a blessing. And that's why at the end of times, there'll be two camps. They'll, as the Prophet ﷺ tells us, there'll be a camp of people who have pure faith. And there'll be those who are completely lost. And that's, that's why we live in blessed times. The times that are testing are times when you can cultivate your faith. And that's the opportunity of troubled times. So in supplication, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by His names. In the supplications themselves, but also when you make dua. That's the other Sorry if it's a troubling question. How often do you, do you make dua? And dua is not words that you say. Dua is meanings that you express. When do you express your need to Allah? That is dua. And then when do you make faithful dua? What is faithful dua? Faithful dua is not your shopping list of life needs. Okay. It's like, you know, you're reminding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, um, please take care of my knee. Oh Allah, uh, please, you know, you know. And some people don't even make those du'as. You go into a restaurant, you hope it's good. Why don't you just make du'a? 
if you actually made dua, you'd actually consider, why don't I check a review? Because if you really want good food, check if the place is good in advance, rather than getting disappointed. But it's not a shopping list of needs. Oh Allah, I need a good wife, I need a good car, I need a good job, I need this. I, I don't need any of those. I don't drive, I'm married, I have work, <laughs> right? But whatever, your shopping list of needs, as if Allah doesn't know your needs. The faithful dua is what, is what do you really need? in life. What do you really need in life? And it's better to make dua with your own words than to recite the duas of the Quran and the Sunnah. If you had just a binary choice after the prayer, let me I recite these three duas from the Quran and Sunnah or you make one dua from your heart. The ulama are in near general agreement that it's better to make the heartfelt dua. The ideal is you do both. You make your heartfelt dua and you make the du'as from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, but you make them with meaning, not just by saying them. Right? And that's why one of the things with du'a after the prayer is keep changing up the du'as you recite after the prayer. That's why the Prophet ﷺ gave us so many different du'as. So you can change it up. So it's coming from the heart. But you cultivate your faith there. And one of the ways you make your du'a meaningful is think of what need do you have and which name of Allah do I turn to that expresses this need? Like we do, you know, you know, your your parents are tough on you, but you have an uncle who's really kind. You get, you know, I, I had an uncle who passed away. He's the one that asked for when I wanted a second treat in the day or a third one, sometimes a fourth one in Pakistan. So, you know, but Depending on what you want, you say, yeah, you know, sometimes you appeal to their love, sometimes to their kindness, sometimes to other things. If you, if you know how to get your way with, with your elders, you have different ways to appeal. If you're married, you know, you have to, there's different pitches you have to make to your spouse to get what you want, typically. Another of the ways we cultivate our faith is by reflection, by reflection. And how do we reflect upon Allah? Right? We reflect upon Allah by reflecting on His names and attributes. Right? Because the mind is incapable of grasping the ultimate reality of God. That is outside the frame of our rational reference. Is Can we absolutely encompass who is God? No. Now we know things about God, he exists, he has these attributes, he has these names, but the names are a bridge to knowing who is my Lord. And by that you know yourself. Who am I? I am, the, I am a servant of that, that Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Allahu la ilaha illa hu, lahu al-asma'ul husna, Allah. There is no God but Him. His are the most beautiful names. Allah, there is no God but Him. There's none worthy of worship but Him. There's none worthy of devotion but Him. There's none free of need of any other whom all are in absolute need of but Him. His is the most beautiful of names. Every name points us to the one named. But it tells us some quality, some meaning that the named possesses. So, what does that mean? When we say, al wadud, the caringly loving, what, what does al wadud mean? What does al wadud mean? Al-Wadud is not just that, that Allah that He Allah is caringly loving. If you think about it this way, who is Al-Wadud? Who is Al-Wadud? Allah, right? So a name points to the one named and tells us something about him. And we often conceive of the divine names wrong. Who is Ar-Rahman? He's not the merciful. 
You can even think of the divine names as, if you think, who is Ar-Rahman? It is Allah, the most merciful. Right? Because the name points to the one named and tells us something about him. Right? Like if you, there's a, there's a kind king, you call him the kind. Right? So you go to the king and you say, um, oh, oh, kind one. Who is the kind one? You're looking in that direction. No, the kind one is the king. Right? So similarly, every name we say, Ya Latif. And all you're thinking about is Allah's gentleness. No. A Latif is Allah the gentle. Right? It is Allah, and you're mentioning the meaning of the gentle. But is Allah nothing but the gentle? Is Allah nothing but the gentle? No. Right? His is the most beautiful names. Every name points to Allah, tells us something about him. But all the other meanings are contained when we say, because we're talking about the king. His are all the most beautiful names. You are approaching him with a focus on a particular name, but all the other names are there because you're calling upon Allah himself. You're not calling upon, oh, mercy of Allah. No, you call, oh, most merciful. You're pointing to Allah through his mercy. But all the other names and attributes should be present. So the merciful is also the majestic, the Lord, the overwhelming, the watchful, all the other names, the just. Right? So his are the most beautiful names. Then he tells us also in the Quran, Rahman. Say, call. On Allah, or call on the Most Merciful, Ar Rahman, Allah the Most Merciful. Whatever name you call upon Him by, His are the most beautiful names. His are the most beautiful names. But practically, this is a this is a tool that is useful. That whenever you call upon Allah with any name, think about it as Allah. The such and such. Rabbi. Who's, who's your Rabb? Allah. So it's as if you're saying, Oh Allah, my Lord. Right? A, knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us about, him, about ourselves. Ibn Atayullah says, be realized in your attributes and he will assist you with his attributes. Right? Our attributes in reality are three. We are weak, needy, and have inability of ourselves. Right? Any strength we have is by Allah. Any fulfillment we have is by Allah. Any ability we have is by Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said, the realization that there's no ability nor power except by Allah is a treasure of the treasures of paradise. So do we have ability? It's a fake question, right? Because yes, no and yes. Or yes and no. Yes, we have ability and power. Otherwise, we're not morally responsible. But it is spiritual strength and emotional, psychological comfort to know that our ability and power is by Allah. We have ability and power, but we are not able and powerful. So if you can't do anything, do you feel overwhelmed? No, because in reality, you don't have independent ability and power. But what you do have is a gift from Allah and a trust from Allah that you're responsible for. So, we, we know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And these are meanings that we seek to cultivate by knowing Allah. That who is Allah? The one worthy of worship. He is the necessary existent. We exist because the necessary existent brought us into existence from nothing. He is the creator and the sustainer. He is the one absolutely free of need of any other whom all are in absolute need of. These are some of the 
the meanings of his being God. Right? And all of these are true. Right? Some of our BADs, our brethren who are attitudinally divergent, say, no, God is the one alone worthy of worship. Yes, but Allah also tells us, Allahu, Allahu khaliqu kulli shay. Allah is the creator of everything. I need to know many different ways of conceiving soundly of God. Because someone says, well, I think that the Lord Vishnu is, is worthy of worship. Now, how do you discuss that with them? You need to know other ways of talking about God. So we, when we turn to Allah by calling upon Allah by His names, there are five or six things that we need to do. Five that are listed here. One is we need to know the meaning of the name. We need to know the meaning of that name. Secondly, we need to know how to turn to Allah by that name. Third, we characterize ourselves by the qualities of that name as a servant of the one who has that name. Fourth, to be realized in the spiritual implications of this name. And the scholars have talked about at length about this. And the fifth duty is to, is to incorporate that into our devotion by calling upon Allah, by making dua to Allah through these names. By calling upon Allah, and inshallah, in upcoming lessons, we'll share a few of the du'as that some of the ulama compiled that encompass these names. Because they found after a while that people struggled. How do I call upon Allah by all his names? They found people were struggling, even if you encourage them. No, sit down and think about it, do this. So they said, okay, let's help them out. Let's put together du'as that are encompassing. And there's some beautiful du'as like this. And we'll be sharing some of them, bi'ithnillah. So the purpose of this class then is we want to increase in our faith and our iman, in our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because knowing the names entails knowing the one named. Secondly, we want to inculcate the qualities of faith within us. Right? Because faith has been described in Quran, the good word is like the good tree. There is a seed that's planted in a soil. That soil is your heart. Its root is firm. And that is, you have faith with certitude. But for it, for a seed, to be firm, what does it require? No, it doesn't require water. Hmm? It needs roots. It doesn't actually require water. You know, my landlord in Jordan, um, he was from a Bedouin tribe. And the lands they owned, sometimes they wouldn't get rain for years. He was showing me how they even grew tomatoes in the, de in the desert. Really? Because tomatoes need quite a lot of water. Because, said, you know, th there are some hills. So on this side of the hill, th there's dew at night and moisture. And this is how they would plant different things in different parts, you know, enough to, to be able to, 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 to live. You don't need water. You need to root the plant. You need to root. What, what are the roots of faith? These are what are called awsaful iman, the qualities of faith. Hope and awe of Allah. Gratitude and patience. Hope. Trust in Allah. Certainty. Love. Yearning. Contentment. Right? These are the qualities of faith which were emphasized by the Prophet ﷺ. But these are cultivated by knowing the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third purpose of this class is to inculcate good character. Why? Because if you know who Allah is, you know who you are as a servant of Allah. First, if you know you're a servant of God, then you have to behave with humility. What industry are you in as a believer?
You're in the service industry. You are a servant, right? So you're in the service industry. Now, what are human beings? Okay. In the service industry, the people around, you are here representing God. You're a servant of God. So the people around you are like the customer. Can you go around, shove the customers, <laughs> you know, tell them off, tell them how you really feel about them? Are you going to retain your job? Probably not, right? But Allah doesn't fire us un until we die, right? But, right, so what do you do? Regardless how you feel, there's a way you conduct yourself in the service industry. Even if the customer is the worst customer possible, you still serve with a smile. So if your friend asks you, why are you putting on that smile? So don't ask me, I just work here, okay? But of course, the good servant is passionate about their work. But those are a rare commodity. Okay? So to inculcate good character. To turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to draw closer to Him. And all of this is embodied in realizing the prophetic perfections. Because every one of the divine names, who is the perfect embodiment of the servant of the one who has those names? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who is the true Abdullah, the true servant of the one named Allah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who is the true Abdul, Abdul Ra'uf, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? Every one of these names is most perfectly embodied in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, th so we'll be looking at each of these names and as we go through by looking at these aspects. And there's a few works that are the main works that we are relying on. There's a famous work, it's translated into English by Imam al-Ghazali, and this is available in English, Imam al-Ghazali on the 99 names. If you like reading, one of the things is there's one chapter in it that's very challenging at the beginning. It's the relationship between the name, the naming, and the named. It's about 20 pages. It's quite intense. At the end of it, Imam al-Ghazali says, none of this really matters, so let's go to what actually does. And one thing you have to appreciate is that reading books is not a devotional act. Sometimes you have to be practical with books. So the ulama suggest that there's books that you can, like complex books, you can read in three cycles. Firstly, just skim through the book. Say, okay, if you know why am I reading this book? Why are you reading Imam Ghazali's book? You have a purpose. It's not that I'm reading this book. I want to learn about the 99 names. So you, you set some goals. So firstly, just go quickly and try to understand each of these names. Do a quick read. Just skim. Then go a second time and deepen your understanding. Now you know the core of what Imam Ghazali has to say. Then a little more. And then he's going into some complicated discussion. You could initially skip them. And then you go read it thoroughly. Do a thorough read. Then you'll actually get not only the basic thing. You'll consolidate the basics. And then go more. Which is also another way you can do that. The ulama say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Kunu Rabbaniyin, be lordly people of knowledge. And Ibn Abbas said that a lordly person of knowledge is the one who teaches others small amounts of knowledge before large amounts of knowledge. But that applies to you as well. If you want to read about the 99 names, first read something really brief about it. But, but worth reading, not superficial. Be being brief does not mean it's superficial. So you get a summary idea. Then you read it something a little more detailed. But again, worth reading. And then you read something deep, but you already have a framework in mind. You know what's the most important things. Then even the more detailed things, you're ready to digest. And that's how all, you know, that's the traditional way of learning that anything you want to tackle, you tackle. Firstly, in brief, and then with the, with the essential details, then you go in depth. So this is one of, one of the, the great works. Um, but admittedly, the English translation is challenging, especially that chapter, but we've told you how to possibly tackle it. The, there's also a great work by Imam Abu Al-Qasim Al-Qushayri, another 5th century Islamic scholar, and a great Imam of Islamic theology and spirituality, and tafsir. One of the, one of the students and critics of Imam al-Ghazali, uh, al-Qadi Abu 
but with deep love and respect for him as well. Al Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al Arabi al Ma'afiri was a great Maliki scholar and Hadith master. He has an amazing work on the 99 names and he, go, he explores the, the meanings of the, the word by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is named. And that's very insightful. And it's a great, rich work in two volumes. Um, Ahmad Zarruq has a work on the 99 names. It's actually translated into English. It's available in an ebook edition. I don't recommend it, but if you dig around, you can, you can find it in the ebook edition. And one of the secrets is the, his last name is spelt in a, in a North African way. Anyways, there's also a, a great grammarian and theologian called Imam al kafiyaji who was one of the main teachers of Imam al siyuti He has a commentary on the 99 names. And Imam al kafiyaji lost his family name because of a book. It's quite fascinating. Imam al kafiyaji was a great scholar and theologian and, and wrote in many sciences, but he was most famous for grammar. Imam Suyuti studied with him for at least 14 years. And, he, and al kafiyaji was brilliant. Once a Suyuti came to him, came to his teacher, al kafiyaji after 12 years of study, and al kafiyaji asked him, tell me about Zaydun Qa'im, which is the most basic sentence in Arabic. Zayd is standing. Imam Suyuti, who's a great Imam of Islam, said, I was offended. How are you going to ask me about the most basic sentence? So he said he, he was quiet. Okay. Right? That's like saying, does, you know, um, you know if, if you ask someone who studied the deen, does using the toilet break your wudu? You're going to test me with that? <laughs> right? Like, you know, the, you don't have to study the deen. Even like a common person should know this, right? And this is something that a child, when they study, this is the first thing. Zayd is standing. So, Al Kafiyaji told him, I have over 130 grammatical investigations related to this. So, I'm a Suyuti. Being a true seeker of knowledge, he said, Wallahi, I'm not going to leave this masjid, this majlis, until you tell me all of them. And he told him all 130 odd investigations. Al Kafiyaji's birth name wasn't Al Kafiyaji. He loved teaching one particular book, which is called the Kafiya of Ibn al Hajib, so much that he became known as Al Kafiyaji, the Kafiya guy. Right? That's not his family name, because you can have many different names. So, you know, let's say someone, someone's very, very generous. We, you know, so instead of calling him Maruf such and such, we call it, they they call him Maruf Al Khairi. Tell us, everyone, you can have many different last names. So that's Al Kafiyaji's commentary, and then there's a commentary by Imam Ahmad ibn Ajiba. Imam Ahmad ibn Ajiba has one of the best commentaries in the 99 names without. Writing a commentary on the 99 names. Ibn Ajiba wrote a tafsir of Surah Al Fatiha called a tafsir, tafsir Al Fatiha Al Kabir. And depending on the edition, it's published in 400 to 800 pages. There's... But to know who is Allah, you have to know the 99 names. So he goes, Allah, you know, Bismillah, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, and then he explains all the other names too. Because you can't know who is Bismillah unless you know, not just Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, but his are the most beautiful names. You have to know the other 99 names to appreciate the Fatiha. One of the benefits of this course is you could, we say Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Depending on how much spiritual vista you have, you should be beholding all these names. Sometimes you're starting something, you start in the name of Allah and you have in mind his mercy, his generosity, whatever, depending on context. Ibn, this work by Ibn Ajiba is translated into English. You can find it at Firdaus Books and elsewhere. Ibn Ajiba on the 99 names of Allah. And it's a brilliant work. It's a little intense because Ibn Ajiba speaks from a very high spiritual point. And once in a while, we'll be dipping into some of the works of tafsir, etc. So that is what we're going to be looking at in this course. 
and next week ta'ala, we'll begin with the divine name Allah right? which is the greatest of names normally each class will be taking about depending on the names about three names but the divine name Allah because that is the personal name of God right? and, the, and arguably the greatest name of God Ismullah al Um so we'll begin there bi'ithnillahi ta'ala wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala sayyidina wa nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen any questions before we close one of the the, the questions online is how do we prepare for this class that's a good thoughtful question there are various works on the 99 names. It helps to, to read up in advance, but you don't have to, you know, we have to dispel this notion that you have to read books. Why? Because there's different purposes for books. You read books, but you also refer to books. A great Italian philosopher, um, intellectual novelist Umberto Eco. Some of you may have heard of him. He wrote The Name of the Rose um, and other works. He has this idea of the unlibrary. What is the unlibrary? Umberto Eco is famous for having one of the great libraries of Europe, great personal libraries of Europe. So he said, When people see my library, he said there are two types of people one who's of interest to me and one who's not. The people not of interest to him, ask him, how many of these books have you read? Says so such a person does, hasn't thought about things and they're not of interest to me. Said so the smart people ask the real question, how many of these books haven't you read? Why? Why would that be? Why is it more significant to know how many of these books haven't you read? Any ideas? No, because the possibility of a library is not just what you've already read. But the possibility of a library is everything that you could acquire of knowledge. What you could acquire of knowledge. So we build a library, not, not okay, I want to read this. You should buy books purposefully. Right? You, what, what did you buy? Either you buy either, either to read or to refer to. At a very basic level. There's other aims. But if you're choosing what to read, you should choose what do you need to read. What will be of most benefit right now for you, either in your deen or your dunya. It's a basic principle. You're going to read one book on marketing, read the best book you can on marketing. And if you're not an expert, consult the experts. That in my context, what's the best book? Is there one best book in marketing? Is there? No. Depends on who you are and what your need is. So, you, you know, you just show up at chapters and say, I want to just pick up a book on marketing. Maybe that's not what you needed. It's for a different. So similarly, this is a general principle of our reading. That if you're choosing to read something now, choose on the basis of need and benefit. Not just whim. That looks good. No. But also, the, the second type of books that you acquire are for reference. And because we want to be purposeful believers. That, okay, what do I need to be able to refer to if there's a Quranic verse that I want to reflect more upon. So you want to have some tafsir. Similarly, I want to have some collections of hadith that if there's a hadith, especially hadith commentary, there's some hadith that I want to understand more about. And other such books, books that explain the words of the Quran, etc. So you build out your library purposefully. Some books on fiqh, that okay, if I want to know the details, okay, how do I get pay my sadaqat al-fitr, etc. So they're books. But you should build those books with consideration and consultation. And one of the things that you should have, you should have at least one or two books on that are worth having on the 99 names. Three that we can refer to in English, and we mentioned the previous slide. One is Imam Ghazali's book on the 99 names. Second is Ibn Ajiba's work on the 99 names. And the third book um, by Tosun Bayrak who passed away a few years ago, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He has a book called The Name and the Named. 
the name and the named. And it's, and it's a beneficial book. There's one aspect that some people get troubled by, that, and that's just tajruba, which mentions that you know, if you repeat this name this number of times, this benefit will arise. And that's just called tajruba. That's just tajruba. Like someone said, you know, if you're stressed, if you breathe in this way, you'll benefit. Do you have to believe them that you will? No, that's just tajruba. Someone did it, it worked. Right? If you keep knocking on a door, you can expect that it'll open anyway. Right? So if you keep calling upon Allah by any name, there will be some benefit anyways. But that's some, some people, rationally minded, get troubled, so skip it over. But it's, it's a useful work by Tosun Bayrak, T-O-S-U-N, called The Name and the Name. So these are three of the books that just read ahead, read a little bit about those names. And there are a few other books out there as well on the names of Allah, some better than others. Um, that's one of the ways, but also to reflect. The reflection is a, is a good thing, بإذن الله تعالى. وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. Any last questions before we close? والحمد لله رب العالمين. تبارك الله تعالى فيكم.